Dear God, thank you so much for everything you bless us with. And thank you for all of the great people that we get to be in contact with, no matter how. Thank you for um, us being able to go to church more and being able to spend more time with each other in person. And please help us to continue to uplift, up, uplift those that we are not able to see all of the time. Please be with Paul Houston as he recovers from his surgery. And thank you so much for the successful surgery. Please be with him and for his whole family and the hard year that they've had. And just thank you for this successful surgery. Please also be with Bonnie and Ken Bean. Um, they've also had a hard year and just please be with Ken and the doctors that work with him and for Bonnie and her well-being and for her to feel comforted and um, to feel loved. And please also help Ramona's mother-in-law and for all of her family members. Thank you for her being able to have sons and daughters that can take care of her and continue to watch over her. And um, just please be with all of them through this time. And finally, please be with Laura Williams as she is also recovering and um, just keep a watchful eye over her and please help her to continue to feel uplifted and loved by all of us. And please help anyone else that we haven't mentioned in our prayer tonight that's on our prayer list or that may be suffering um, silently that we don't even know about. And please help us to be kind to others and walk um, through life the way that you plan for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so as I kept studying this lesson um, with this, the fragrance of emptiness and being poor in spirit, um, the song that just kept going through my mind was um, None of Self and All of Thee, because um, that is exactly what we're talking about. And we're talking about the transformation that that song talks about. And um, so I, I went ahead, we're, we're going to read the words to it. I could not find a recording of it on YouTube. Um, there was only one that was acapella and all you could hear was the song leader and I didn't really want to do that. So we're just going to read through the words um, and just meditate and think about this, um, this transformation of emptying ourselves. Okay. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be. When I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee. When I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee, yet he found me, I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree and my wistful, wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee, some of self and some of thee, some of self and some of thee. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee, less of self and more of thee, less of self and more of thee, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self and more of thee, higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee, none of self and all of thee, none of self and all of thee. Lord, thy love at last has conquered none of self and all of thee. Good prep for your lesson, Nicole. <laughs> that is perfect for our lesson. <laughs> right, so that is perfect for tonight, for our story tonight, because um, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, this is the beginning of the Beatitudes. So um, this week is lesson five. It's the fragrance of emptiness, and that's uh, page 63 in your book. And so this is like the little thing at the top. It, you know, it says the fragrance of emptiness, and then right below it, it has this little paragraph. And I thought it was perfect to lead into our study tonight, which is 
I mean, probably I should put it there. Um, so the aroma of Christ is an amazing fragrance. It's powerful perfume both reveals the putrid nature of sin and is an invitation to be someone new in Jesus. It is a beautiful scent that is blended together by God himself in the hearts of his children. This week, we will examine the first ingredient in the rich fragrance that transforms us to look like Jesus. Poverty of spirit opens our hearts to the richness of God's grace. And so that was by the author of this book. And I just thought that was great because we're talking about this aroma of Christ and this perfume and smelling like, um, smelling like Jesus and looking like Jesus. And so um, this kind of starts, it's like the first ingredient if you were making a fragrance um, to smell like God, smell like Jesus. All right, so fragrance of emptiness. And I will put out there that when I read, like it's Matthew chapter five, verse three. And when I learned the Beatitudes, I don't know, at camp, uh, maybe 20 years ago, something like that. I always learn to say blessed, but then when I look at this, I say blessed. So I don't really know, you know, the right, right one, but if I switch between the two, that's why, because uh, part of me is saying it in my head and the other part is reading it. But Matthew 5, chapter five, verse three, the first beatitude says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, um, about the poor in spirit. So first of all, what does poor in spirit mean? Because when I got this one and saw that it was the poor in spirit, I was like, that's going to take, uh, that's not one that's easy. Not that any of the Beatitudes are really easy for me to explain, but it's one of the trickier ones. <laughs> so um, I did a lot of searching. I looked a lot of different sources and different like websites and people and articles and stuff. Um, and these are kind of like a couple different meanings that all pretty much mean the same thing, but they're said differently in different ways. So one person said that it was spiritual poverty. So like a need for God. And I put that one first because that's pretty much like the summing up of it being completely, um, uh, like being completely poor, um, and needing God. So to elaborate on that, uh, another person had said to recognize your spiritual bankruptcy before God and understand that you have absolutely nothing of worth to offer God. And that kind of like took me aback because that's kind of like weird to think about that we, I mean, God has everything and he provides everything. Um, and it's not like we're doing anything for him. Uh, if that makes sense. And so I just like, I found that one and I kind of found, thought that it was very interesting. And if you guys, I forgot to say at the beginning, but if you have anything to say, just pop on in because these, like I said, are just a bunch of different interpretations that um, I'm kind of bringing here. And so if you agree or disagree, that's totally fine. Um, just let me know. And so another one is admitting that because of your sin, you are completely destitute spiritually and can do nothing to deliver yourself from your dire situation. And so that also goes back to like Jesus being on the cross and like, there's nothing we could have done to wash away our sins without Jesus. And so he did that, but like without that, there would have been nothing, um, like it says there to deliver us from our dire situation, nothing we could have done, none of the works in our lifetime. And the last bullet point there says, recognize the utter worthlessness of our own spiritual currency and the inability of our own works to save us, which is kind of like what I just said of um, our spiritual currency. Like we couldn't have done anything. None of our own works would have saved us and um, sent us to heaven. And so it really took Jesus stepping in to do that. And so without that, and without that need for God and like that um, need for salvation, we wouldn't be able to get to that point, which I think we all pretty much know. And so um, imagine that you are, or imagine a beggar or a pauper, which they're like the poorest of the poor. There's no luxuries. They don't even really have the basics and they're just trying to get money for food for that day or for their family, just so that they might survive. And so this is kind of like 
a visual for thinking about being poor in spirit. So a beggar on the side of the street, their need and their desperation is so public. So they can't hide it. They can't hide um, like we could hide our, um, like having nothing. Um, they can't hide that. It is so public that everyone knows the whole world can see that they have nothing. And they're just depending on like the grace and the mercy of others. And it's also... I think she said in here um, that it's also she said something about pain. Um, sorry. Yeah, the picture of severe poverty is also tinged with fear and trembling. And so, I mean, I can't imagine how scary that would be. Um, and I can't put myself in their position at all, but to have that kind of public um, I don't know, I don't want to say burden, but a public, like, life that you're living that others may, like, look down on or others don't understand, but they have nothing, so we should be like that, poor in spirit, to approach each moment with God. So if we are spiritual beggars or spiritual paupers, then we are dependent on him for every good gift and our hearts are empty and broken before him. And one of the things that um, Cassandra Martin says, she says, admitting our need and acknowledging our emptiness is the only way to be filled with the richness of God. So we're going to talk about that a lot more tonight, but that's just kind of good, like going into it to talk a little bit about being poor in spirit. Um, because I think a lot of times when I was um, in, you know, third grade, when I learned the Beatitudes, I didn't know what poor in spirit meant. And probably like even through high school, you don't, we, as a group of teachers, we're talking about how excited we were to be teaching about the Beatitudes because it's something that you don't really dive into deeply to, you know, you may know them, you have memorized them since you were a kid, but it's not something that people can automatically, I guess, translate into like terms that we know in our world today. And so that's one of the things that I just wanted to, so we're all kind of on the same page of being just completely broken and like being completely empty so that we can be filled with the richness of God. So the Beatitudes are written in the present tense. So they're not like a to-do list that you check off and move on. So it's not like I'll be poor in spirit once and then um, I can go back to being full of myself and egotistical and not have to worry about it. They're a state of being. And Cassandra also says in the book to examine your heart and look closely at your need. Your need doesn't scare God. Your emptiness doesn't bewilder him. Your brokenness allows him to shape you. Being poor in spirit allows him to fill you with the richness of his presence. And I love that because I think so many times it's so hard to, um, to fully be yourself with God. And even though he should be the person that we're most comfortable with being, um, like with being needy with, be, with being empty with, with being broken with, um, poor in spirit, like all of those, we should have no problem doing that. But for some reason, at least for me, it's kind of hard to do that. It takes a lot of practice to be completely like 100% open all the time. Um, and I think there's always like a fear of failing him or of him being disappointed, but he uses that and he, uh, it doesn't scare him. It doesn't bewilder him. It allows him to shape you into what he wants for your life into what is going to be, um, the best for your walk with him, which I think is really cool. Oops. So the next part for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven can either be, I mean, she talks about it like in both ways of it could be on or in heaven for eternity or also our life on earth before death. So the kingdom of heaven for eternity, we can go to Romans chapter six, verse 23. And I also wrote it on there. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So it's kind of like 
like you like absolutely we know about the kingdom in heaven for all of eternity and so it's just so um like reaffirming that it says it's a free gift of God and it's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord and um to be like just for our I don't know just for like following him which I think is I always talk about you love free things and I know that God's this whole walk isn't easy but it is like it's just opening your heart and it's just going to God it's not and there are so many groups that you have to pay to be a part of and then they are supposed to you know wipe away your sins or um you pay and it gets you into heaven but our relationship with God and our gift of eternal salvation is free um with our salvation and then also the eternal quality of life with God before death. So John 10, 10 says, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So living with God before our death, um, that last part of they may have life and have it abundantly too. So just to be able to like live out our life and we're obviously going to have a lot of heartache and we're going to have struggles and challenges. Um, but it's also going to be easier with God there and with God walking with us. And then Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine say, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. And so that part is like salvation by faith, not by works. And, um, so everyone, if you have faith and you, if you've been saved by faith, you get that gift of God. And so it's not like a, I'm better than you or a, any kind of boastful thing. Although it is something that we're proud of, but everyone has the opportunity. And we must recognize our sinfulness before we can understand the need for a savior. So we must admit our spiritual poverty before we can receive the spiritual riches that God offers. In Ephesians chapter one, verse three says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so, I mean, I think that speaks wonders that Ephesians chapter one, verse three, verse of um, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And all we have to do is recognize our sinfulness and the need for a savior and then admitting it, and we receive all of those blessings and all of those riches that God offers. Okay, so now we get into Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, and if you're following along in the book, it's kind of um, page 66, and so this is a parable of a great banquet, and so Jesus is telling this parable and he says, but he said to, but he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of, at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a field and I must go see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to, and I need to go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what have you commanded? What you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. And so this was a parable to talk about being poor in spirit and what it means to be poor in spirit. So his original guest, he had invited this mass of people and it doesn't say how long it had been since he had invited them, um, but they were not waiting with anticipation. Like they probably didn't have calendars back then, but they certainly weren't counting down the days to 
this feast. Um, they were wrapped up with their own lives. And then when the servant came to tell them like, hey, remember that banquet we invited you to? It's ready. They had like just terrible excuses. And one of the things that I read on this was like, you don't buy land or like a house. You don't buy property without checking it out, which was one of the excuses. You probably don't buy oxen or any kind of animal without checking it out as well. And then like, why would being married prevent you from coming to a banquet? You could just like ask for a plus one kind of thing. Um, so they had just like really terrible things. And so the, ma the master was rightfully annoyed by that and rightfully hurt um, because he had spent so much time and he had prepared so much and had invited his friends or had invited these people. And so that's a lot like how God has prepared a banquet for us. And he spared no expense to make things ready for us to join or to join him in his home and delight in his presence. And then Jesus is kind of like the servant who announces and um, his very life and death declare, come for everything is now ready. And then um, at the bottom part there is one of the things that on 67, she like puts in a box, which, you know, it's a key point if she puts it in a box. She said, we are the invited guests. How we answer this moment reveals much about our hearts. And so it does talk a lot. I mean, like, it does make me think a lot about what, um, like what we are invited to that we're not going to, I think, so I think sometimes you get comfortable with things and you take things for granted. I mean, I know that. And so maybe, um, maybe they've already been invited to this master's banquet a couple times and they like wanted to make an excuse to leave. But as I was reading that, I was just thinking about the things that I haven't flaked on, but just have been like, no, I, I can't make it or like, no, I'm not going to, and don't make it a priority and, um, how I take that for granted. Like sometimes, I mean, I think I'm a pretty good friend, but like, there are times that I've taken friendships for granted and like, been like, oh, I'd rather stay home tonight than go watch your thing. Um, that's like 30 minutes away. And, but just because, I don't know. I've been to a lot of them. So anyways, I'm not trying to <laughs> throw myself under the bus or make excuses for myself, but I think we do that a lot in our own lives. And then, and we have to be like triple sure not to take advantage of our friends and our family for one, but also not to take advantage of God and all the things that he's provided for us and all the opportunities he gives us. And, um, all the love he pours out for us, not to take advantage of all that. So the men in the parable made choices to put these things above the banquet. They chose material possessions, which would be like the field or the property or the land, whatever your translation said, jobs and activities like the, or maybe it's opposite of the oxen, you know what I mean? And then relationships like the guy that got married. Um, so my question for you, and it's an easy one, how can these things hinder our relationship with God or keep us from being poor in spirit. So how can those three things or anything else, but those are kind of the ones talked about in the parable and kind of big ones that I can think of um, that I've seen people personally be hindered in their relationship or kept them, like maybe kept them from church or kept them from being humble. What do you guys think? I just think that they, oh, made, they made so many things more important than the invitation, you know, where, where are the priorities? Right. Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. It's hard to judge social cues on Zoom. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I was just saying, or thinking that um, I think sometimes when we have our needs like our physical needs met and um, which is most of us in the United States, um, mm -hmm. and things aren't hard and I don't know, we have stuff like, I think sometimes we think that we earned everything ourselves mm -hmm. and that we're almost like entitled to the 
to the life that we live. And I think a lot of times it can blind us to our need for God. Um, you know, how many people that are, you know, have all their needs met, like sometimes people aren't even sure if there is a God, but yet their, their needs are met. And, um, or if they think there's a God, you know, they're, they're too busy to spend time with him or, um, they just think, yeah, they, they either are too busy or, or they just think that, that, uh, everything they got, they earn themselves. And I mean, I think that's like the non-Christian view of things, but I think that as Christians, we can sometimes fall into that trap as well. And, and that really is how that has provided for us. And um, yeah, exactly. Uh, Nicole, this, yeah. is Donna. this is Donna. I, what really hit me back when you were talking about porn spirit and you were talking about the beggar or the poor man. Right. And I really like what she wrote about that this beggar is acutely aware mm -hmm. of her emptiness. You know, I don't know if we're many times if we're acutely aware of our emptiness without God, you know, right. and we're so we have this like, you know, the others were saying we have this comfortable life, you know, and we do have our needs net met our physical need, needs and you know some of our emotional and and we don't see the need we get so wrapped up in the world that you know that's such a danger to you know to not see our need for god yeah exactly mm -hmm. yes yes great thoughts and that takes us to our next one that we talk about how many of those things that we just talked about did would a beggar have on the street? So we talked about material possessions, jobs, and ooh, activities, and relationships. So when the master sends the servant to buy anyone they see on the streets to the feast, those people don't have anything. For them, there is no possession as extravagant as the feast, no job that compares to the banquet, no relationship that ties them to the street corner. So they have like nothing to lose. And on top of that, they are probably shivering and they're begging, they've been begging all day or all week, whatever. And they delight in the warmth and most likely the food of the host's gracious welcome. So when you put it into that perspective of like the people that he invited didn't come to him because of all those things that they have, like because of all of those things that they put above his banquet. And then the people on the streets, they didn't have any of that. They don't have those luxuries and they don't have those um, blessings of having a lot of material possessions that they would need to go check out. And they don't have, they probably don't have jobs or really activities and activities could be, you know, anything like modern day activities would be I guess like a sports is all sports always comes to mind just because I know that sports schedules are so crazy. Um, but yeah, any kind of like job or sports or theater or band or um, school projects, anything like that, that would, that would like qualify as a job or an activity. Um, and then relationships. So unfortunately, usually people that are on the streets don't have those relationships and that's why they are on the streets um and certainly nothing that's going to tie them to the street corner for that night so uh and then we talk about how jesus was poor in spirit so the whole point of this book is to talk about the aroma of christ the fragrance of christ and then becoming more like christ by those things, like by the Beatitudes. Um, and so ours is poor in spirit. And so we've talked about um, the grand ceremony, the banquet, and the people that were poor physically there. And now we're going to talk about Jesus, who was poor in spirit. So Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in 
in the form of God did not count equality with God to a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a, on a cross. So some of your translations, or like in the book, the part that I bolded there, that is uh, verse 7, it says, I knew I should have read this down. Um, some of the translations say, but made himself nothing. So my translation is ESV and it says, but emptied himself. And so you can think of either of those ones, completely emptying himself or just being made or made himself nothing. So um, whichever way helps you to think about that. But Jesus's path and this whole paragraph at the bottom is kind of paraphrased from a bunch of different things that Cassandra says throughout this lesson or throughout this day in this lesson. Um, but she talks about how Jesus's path is one of submission, humility, and obedience. While being fully God, he doesn't argue about his rights. And I've like never really thought about that. I have thought about that because obviously you talk about um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You talk about God and Jesus, but it's always, I mean, I wouldn't say that people always put Jesus second, but it kind of almost seems like that's usually the way that I think about it at least. And it's not anything intentional. It's not taking away credit from Jesus or anything like that, but, um, it makes, she makes a great point, And even the Bible says it of he, though he was in, he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So like he didn't argue about his rights. He didn't grasp for equality as a creator, but rather he becomes one of the created. So he was a physical human being. He doesn't hold tightly onto the position of king of kings, but he takes the nature of a servant. And in there, one of the questions she asks on page 70 is, in what way do we grasp at positions and privilege? And how does that interfere with being poor in spirit before God? And so that's one of the things that um, Jesus wasn't concerned about titles. He wasn't, didn't want, I mean, necessarily to be called the creator or to hold tightly onto his position as king of kings. Um, and he does take a, a servant role instead. Um, it says the master of life became a man and the yeah, master of life became a man and became obedient to death. He empties himself and sets his focus on his connection with God. He completely trusts and depends on God's love. And I had just never really thought about that before. I can't tell you how many times I've probably read Philippians 2, 5 through 8 and haven't delved this deep into it to think about Jesus being in human form and being humbled in his human form um, and obedient even to the point of death and like just how much he has to trust in God. I mean, he was put on earth with, I mean, he didn't have any friends really. He was born into a weird situation. Like he had so many things stacked up against him um, with the world that he was living in. And he still completely trusted in God and depended on God. And I think that's just something that we can use in our everyday lives of like, we know we've seen how great God is through his word. And so that's something that as hard as it may be, we should continue to work on completely trusting on trusting in him and depending on him and focusing, setting our focus and our connection on God. So the big question, how do we empty ourselves like Jesus did? Or how do we, if your translation says, made himself nothing. How do you make yourself nothing like Jesus did? And I'm all about the ABCs. And so I loved that this was brought into this lesson that they have, she put the ABCs of emptying ourselves like Jesus did. And so um, the A is avoid. So avoid the tainted things of the world. And just to kind of sum up what she said, um, like a kind of 
partying, like avoid the taint, the taint of things of the world. And you can do that by. And so that's to examine your exposure to attitudes, influences, and entertainment that will not bring us closer to God's will for our life. And I think obviously none of these are going to be easy. None of these ABCs are going to be easy. But to start, like that's such a hard one because we are like so like we are in this world, but not of this world. And so like, even though we're in it, we still have to be, you know, we still have to be God's people. And so it is very hard to avoid things that you may not have any control over. Like now it's everywhere. It's on you know, schools near us have been in the news for books that they're making their kids read, or that is an option for kids to read. There's like shoe companies that are in trouble for making a shoe that's out of line. Like there's just so much. And even if you're not looking at social media, or even if you're not um, like playing the video games or being on TikTok or Instagram or anything like that, like you are still surrounded by it. Um, so that's very hard to avoid it, but we should try to avoid all of those things or remove the exposures or maybe negative attitudes or influences of entertainment, which is easier said than done, like I said. And the B is for banish. So banish the habits and attitudes that don't look like Jesus. And so that's to put away anything like our vices. So we all have different vices. And she talks about that in the book. Um, and how usually, I mean, I think actually that is the definition of vices are like bad things, like things that you depend on, things that you lean on, things that you do that are not good for you. Um, so to put away anything like your vices that interfere, interferes with his purpose for our lives, it's impossible to fill ourselves with God when we are full of ourselves. So that goes back to being like completely empty. Well, that's yeah, sorry. Um, so with trying to be completely empty is we have to remove all of those things that were a part of ourselves. And then we can fill ourselves up with God. And then the C is to commit to making his desires your desires. And so to fill your heart with his word and look to Jesus as an example because Jesus lived a life that demonstrated that he trusted God to answer every need of his heart. And so we kind of just talked about that of Jesus was so trustworthy and so obedient at his, during his time on earth. And even like when he was not on earth. Um, and so committing to be like that and to live like Jesus. So now we get to the next example of being poor in spirit. And so instead of, well, I don't know, you'll see, but basically it's the woman at the well, the story of the woman at the well. And it's John chapter four, verses one through 26, which is a long passage. So I didn't want to read it, but I did a couple bullet points. And I also tried to make these go with the questions that she, that Cassandra asked on page 73. Um, because she's kind of like, read this and then answer all these things. So if you did that, then you'll be familiar with these. So the woman at the well, Jesus is, Jesus and his disciples are going through, um, S Samaria and they could have gone around it, but they chose to go through it. And so Jesus guided them through it and he went to the well and he met a Samaritan woman. So if you don't know, Jews and Samaritans don't get along very well. And um, that always reminds me, I almost did like a little uh, good Samaritan story recap, but Jews and Samaritans don't get along very well. Obviously, Jesus being a Jew and this woman being a Samaritan. So Jesus walks up to the woman and he asks for water. And this surprised her because she lived in a time where women were not, like, probably not seen as much. They definitely weren't. Um, and he treated her with such kindness and respect. And he was a man and he was Jewish and she was a woman and she was a Samaritan. And so that was the first thing that took her by surprise was just his kindness when he came up to her. So he, she 
is asking him like, why, why, why did you come up to me? Why are you talking to me kind of thing? And he said, I would like a drink of water. And she, sorry, I'm kind of butchering this, um, but she, let me rewind. Let me go to the bottom of page 73. It says, as Jesus, this is a kind of a summary that takes us to this point. As Jesus waits by the well, hot and thirsty, a woman approaches and she carries a water jar intent on going to the well to collect water for the needs of her household. We know little about her physical appearance and we are given a clear view of her heart. She carries a burden on her soul that is much heavier than the clay water jar that she shoulders. Guilt, shame, and rec recrimination all weigh down on her. She's a woman in a society that views women as property, and she is a Samaritan in a land that views her very existence as a defilement. She is poor in a society that gives preference to the wealthy. She's a sinner. Her past is a rock in her heart, and her future looks hopeless. So this woman is out in the middle of the day getting water, which is unusual because it's very hot during that time. And so, but she goes during this time because she is often um, like kind of made fun of or just kind of excluded from the other women that are there because she has these things that are not, you know, perfect or like the perfect Samaritan woman kind of thing. Um, so she's a sinner like we all are. And so she says, she asks, um, <laughs> Jesus asks for water from the woman. And she was so surprised that he was asking, but he offers her a drink of the living water. So the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have, or have to come here to draw water. And so that's John 4, 15. And um, he said to go get her husband. And she was like, well, I don't have a husband. And he's like, you're right, because you've had five. And so that was one of the parts that like, was hardest for her because she felt that shame and um I don't know embarrassment from having five husbands and knowing that and like that was what she carried around with her like all the time and like the big stress on her and why um so many people were not welcoming to her and not kind to her and so Jesus just comes out and says that like he knows about it and how comforting would that be to not have to tell Jesus I mean like she did tell him but like he already knows and he's still talking to her and I think that's kind of a cool thing that even with your worst sin God knows Jesus knows and they still love you and they still want to be there for you and want you to follow them and um, live with them and so that also takes her by surprise and then she asks about worship. So he, she says, um, she says, do you have to go to Jerusalem to worship? And he was saying, you can worship from anywhere. God is anywhere. You don't have to be in a certain place to worship him. And then she responds with, I know Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will tell us all of these things. And then Jesus flips it and says, basically, I am who you speak of. And so this whole time she's talking about, she knows Christ is coming. She knows that he's going to, you know, make things better and have um, all these answers for her. And then she's been talking to him the whole time, which explains his whole demeanor of being kind. And if you think about it, that's how we should all be whenever we meet someone, no matter what no matter who they are, no matter what they believe, um, that we should always surprise them with how much love and kindness we have for them and to continue to be like Jesus that way. So to wrap it all up, this woman, the woman at the well had nothing. She was a true poor in spirit situation and um, she didn't have friends. She didn't have a husband. She didn't have, like, she was working herself twice as hard just to avoid people that were going to make her feel bad about herself um, and shameful. But after meeting Jesus, she was filled with hope, love, and a desire to follow him. 
And because she was poor in spirit, she was, she had nothing standing in her way from being completely filled up with the richness of God's word. And so he tells her, Jesus tells her going back to her asking about worship. He tells her that the presence of God is not limited to a physical location, that he is a spirit. He is spirit. And he searches for hearts that long to be in his presence hearts that recognize that they're poor and souls that acknowledge the depth of their need. And so I think he could see that she was definitely like poor and that she needed, she had such a deep need for him and such a deep need for his love and his understanding and his guidance. And he was able to provide that for her. And I just think that's one of the coolest stories. So I was glad that that one came up in this, in this story as well. So I picked this way before I even knew that the ABCs and the woman in the well and Good Samaritan kind of tie in. We're all going to be in there, but um, those are some good ones. So that's all I have for you guys, but please feel free to share more, more thoughts, ask questions, um, whatever you would like to do. But thank you so much for coming tonight. And there are my credits. Yeah, I think one thing I, I was thinking about, you know, you were talking about how she was poor and, you know, she had nothing and she knew it, but not only was she poor and all that, but she could recognize that he was Christ and opened up her heart to him. She had a receptive heart. Yes, that's true. As just being in poverty. Yes. Know, you know yeah, I mean? that's a great point. Lynn. You know that and meant that, but I just, it just struck me that, you know, she had that receptive heart that we're supposed to have, that we need to have to be truly yes. born in spirit. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for adding that. And another uh, thing about this story, she left her a container that she came to pick up the water with. And I guess she felt so much happy in her heart mm -hmm. that she totally forgot her physical need and she meant what spiritual need she had and she was excited about it and she totally ignored physical need that she needed the water from the well <laughs> right exactly more than once during this lesson for an answer to her question I've put pray for it. Um, and I've never, ever in my life, I don't think, prayed to be poor in spirit. Right. Um, I know before this. We definitely need to be praying for that because then, then that will help us to be that way and it will help God to fill us with what, with Him, you know, yeah. and with what He wants to do with us. Absolutely. So for those ABCs. We did ABCP praise last one. <laughs> you do ABCD and D is don't forget to pray. Keeping that in line. <laughs>